Okay, today we're going to look at the state pattern. First, we're going to see why it can be helpful, and then we'll implement it using the traditional structure outlined in the classic Gang of Four Design Patterns book, and then we'll see what Kotlin language features we can use to reduce some of its boilerplate. So let's go. Here we've got a class that represents a user, and in this code, the user can go through different states. So starting off as an anonymous user, then after signing up, uh, would be in this unverified state, and then once the email has been verified, then the user is fully authenticated and can do all sorts of things, including viewing content, viewing his profile, and editing his profile. And as the code is currently structured, we end up checking the user's state in each of these functions. And we do something different depending on what that state is. Now, let's imagine what would happen if we were to add a fourth state. So for example, we could add a new locked state for those cases where maybe suspicious activity was detected. And when we do that, we get a compiler error on each of these functions. So we have to visit each one and provide a case for our new locked state. And in this example code, we've only got a few functions and the logic is very simple. Uh, we're just calling print line in most of the cases, but the more functions we have here and the more complex the logic around these states is, the uh, more difficult it's going to be to add or remove a state. Now, when we have to make a change to our code, usually there are corresponding lines of code that have to change in tandem. And that's demonstrated in our example code here. When we try to add a new entry for user state, we also have to add a new case for each of these functions. So when multiple lines of code have to change in tandem, the farther apart they are, like the more spread out they are throughout the code base, the more difficult it's going to be to maintain. And ideally, any lines of code that are likely to change in tandem should be located nearby to each other. Or as I like to say, code that grows together goes together. So rather than grouping our code by function, let's group our code by state. And to do that, we're going to apply the classic state pattern. So let's remove the fourth state and just focus on the original three states that we had. Now, when applying the state pattern, we start off with an interface that represents our state. And we're including each of the functions from the user class, but we also need to pass the user object into these functions uh, so that the user state objects can manipulate it. Now, we're going to use this in place of the enum class. So let's remove the import that we had for all of its members. And we'll also replace the enum class with objects just representing each state. And of course, each state is going to implement our interface. Now, let's start with the anonymous state object. Uh, to implement its functions, we'll just copy and paste the function declarations from the interface right into the anonymous object there. And of course, we'll need to add the override keyword to each of these. And now that we've got each function listed here, we just need to snag the code that we were using for the anonymous case in each function and just paste it into our state object. So. We can come down here and grab this body, paste it up here. And since this is no longer referring to the user, we're going to have to explicitly rename the receiver to user. And of course, the uh, we're not using an enum class, so we need to change this to the typical uppercase first letter. Okay, easy enough. Let's do the same thing for the rest of these functions. We'll just uh, come down here and copy from the anonymous case. And paste that in. And we'll get this other one from view content. And we'll paste that in up here. And we'll come down here and get the one for view profile. and paste it in. And we got one more, this edit profile here. And with this, we have successfully arranged the code for the anonymous state into its own state object. And the process is going to be exactly the same for unverified and authenticated states. 
You've already seen the process though, so rather than copying and pasting those pieces one at a time, I'll just paste in the end result so you can see what it looks like when everything's there. So here you can see I simply filled out the functions for the other two states, and I also removed the leftover code that was in each of the functions in the user class. So let's update our user class so that it delegates to this new user state object. And this part's gonna feel a lot like the strategy pattern that we covered a few weeks back. And with this, we've got a classic state pattern as described by the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. And there's certainly a lot of boilerplate here, uh, but with this arrangement, we've co-located the code for each state. And I suspect a lot of us would find it easier to reason about the different states and their effects when the code is arranged this way. So the terms that are used for the state pattern in the Gang of Four book are pretty straightforward. Our user class down here is called the context, and the interface up here is called the state, of course. And then each object that implements that interface is called a concrete state. Now, like I said before, this is quite a bit of boilerplate. If we had a lot of complex logic happening in each one of these, I think it'd be fine as it is. I'd probably just separate them out into different files and be done. But for such a simple example, where we're just calling print line in most of the cases, we could use some of Kotlin's language features to reduce the boilerplate. So let's see what that looks like. So one of the biggest causes of boilerplate here is that we have to declare the override for each of these functions in each of our state objects. And that means we have to include the override keyword and the fun keyword, the name of the function, the list of the parameters and their types for each function and for each state. So I'm gonna reduce that by replacing the functions with properties that have a function type. So to get started, I'm actually gonna change from an interface back to an enum class. And we don't have to use an enum class in particular here. We could just use a regular class and instantiate an object for each state. But the enum class would allow us to still enumerate or exhaustively match them later if we wanted to. So I'm gonna go with that. Now, like I said earlier, I'm going to replace these functions with properties that have function types. So let's change all of these fun keywords to val, and we're gonna turn the signature into the type, actually. And now each entry in this enum class will need to provide these properties. So let's start with the anonymous entry here. And we're gonna do something similar to before. I'm just gonna cut and paste the body from the old object up to the new enum constructor call. And it pretty well just plops right in, but we do need to add some parameters to the Lambda, so we just add user and email like this. Okay, great. And we can cut and paste the function bodies for the other four, let's do that. We'll just go down here and grab the body for each one and paste it right in. Okay, great. And with that, we can also, of course, eliminate these old function overrides. And that could be fine for the anonymous entry, but we're really only using the Lambda parameters in the signup function. We're not actually using them in any of these other functions. So for the rest of these Lambda parameters, since we aren't using them, we can just replace them with underscores. I'm gonna do that next here. And as you recall, when we've got a single Lambda parameter, we don't have to explicitly declare it. We can just use the implicit it instead. So in other words, we can remove the parameter from this view profile entirely. Now this ain't bad, but I'm going to get this signup function all on one line by using semicolons, just to take up a little less space. Yikes, semicolons in Kotlin, preposterous. Okay, and we can go through the same process for the unverified and authenticated states. 
And like before, instead of stepping through all that one function at a time, I'm just gonna paste in the end result. Okay, great, now this is fine, but if we want, and I'm not saying we have to, but if we want, we can get rid of 100% of the Lambda parameter declarations here. And the way that we would do that is by converting them to lambdas with receivers. So in other words, we're gonna remove the lambda parameter from inside the parentheses here. And we're gonna put them on the outside of the parentheses with a dot like this. And with this change, the user object can be referenced with the this keyword. And as mentioned before, when there's only one Lambda parameter, we don't have to declare it. We could just use the implicit it instead. So that means we can get rid of these cases where we've got just one Lambda parameter. So we'll get rid of email and we'll change it to it. And then the empty ones here, we can just get rid of entirely. And let's just make the same changes to the other two enum entries. And with this, we've really reduced the boilerplate, but we've still got the essence of the state pattern. Now, what do you think? Do we take this too far? We might have. By eliminating all of the Lambda parameter declarations, we might have made it more difficult for other developers to actually figure out what parameters these functions have a reference to. But still, it was a lot of fun to see how far we could go with it. Well, there we go. By arranging our code into state objects, we've made it easier to add or remove states, and we've kept the related code together. And with function types and lambdas with receivers, we were also able to reduce a lot of the boilerplate, and maybe even a little too much, but it was still a lot of fun. Speaking of fun, we're finally ready for the second episode of the Type Alias Show live stream. We're planning on that for Wednesday, September 18th at the usual time, 10 a.m. U.S. Central. And as you know, I typically release a new video every other week on Wednesday. And so the next time, instead of a pre-recorded video, we'll just do a live stream where you can interact with me. We'll get into some of the latest things happening in the Kotlin and Android worlds. I'll answer some of your questions and a whole lot more. You can stay looped in on those plans by joining hundreds of other Kotlin developers who have signed up for my email newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter today at newsletter.typealias.com. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today, and I will see you next time at the live stream.